Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Michelle Toffel, Chief Innovation Officer of College Summit. Touching the lives of 50,000 high school students annually, College Summit is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated to making higher education possible for low-income youth. Michelle has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Michelle, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So, touching the lives of 50,000 high school students is a prodigious task. Talk about your programs and how College Summit approaches the task of making college education possible for low-income youth. So, one of the core pieces of our program is the work we do with peer leadership. Every year, we work with about 2,000 young people, 17-year-olds typically, who are going into their senior year of high school and we take them to what's effectively a, a college boot camp for four days. They come to a college campus, they work with a college counselor, they work with a volunteer who's a writing coach, they meet with youth facilitators who help them explore the barriers they feel they face on their way to college, and they connect with each other. And we run these workshops, these boot camps around the country, and those students then are the peer leaders in the school. They go into their school in the fall, they work with their teachers, they have a lot of support from College Summit, and they really affect the culture of the school and create that college-going culture that can have a sustaining, lasting change. What percentage of the, uh, of the young people that you touch are first in their families, or would be first in their families, to graduate from a four-year uh, higher education institution? A very high percentage. Um, we don't have the exact numbers, but most of our students are what we call first-generation college goers. Mm -hmm. um, they may have had a sibling go to college before them, but they're typically, um, because they're low income, they're, their parents have not gone to college. And very often that means that there are a whole set of issues that attach to that. First of all, the, intimida the intimidation factor mm -hmm. of actually just getting the forms and going through that college application process can be very daunting for someone who, whose uh, literacy skills might not be uh, uh, particularly high, um, or even if they are, um, that is not gone through the process themselves, just that fact can act as a barrier to a, a young person's eventual uh, education trajectory. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at the numbers, it's stark. If you look at middle and high income students who get Ds in school, mm -hmm. they go to college at the same rate as low income students who get As. So we know that there are other challenges for low income kids, but the reality is that um, income really is the biggest barrier. When we're working with students, I think of it as two-prong. It's both process and sort of the steps and the tactical filling out the forms and getting to college and going through the hoops um, because it is a process. And it's also belief and it's having the belief in, in yourself that you are college material, that despite what some of the messages are in your life around you, you can make it, you can be successful. And one of the components of that is working with um, families. So we, College Summit, most of our program is, is through high schools. Um, we, I told you about the college boot camp. That's work we do directly with students. And then in the, in the school year, schools are really responsible for running the program. And as part of that, they are tackling some of the barriers that families feel they face. You know, a lot of families don't want their kids to go away to college. They, they know they're gonna change. Um, and there are different cultural expectations with that. So we really try to encourage students to self-advocate and have those conversations with their parents and with their families and be part of, of making that change. And you know, we've got a lot of stories from um, young people who have gone back as not just ambassadors for their peers, but for their family and have been the first one to go and then their siblings go and their cousins go and then eventually their children will go to college. So College Summit is really creating a context um, and transmitting some, some knowledge, helping to, to train, but really the programs are shaped uh, locally. They're shaped by the students that you train themselves, they're shaped by the school districts, they're shaped by the communities yeah. in which your programs operate. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's very locally dependent. We're um, in a lot of communities across the country. Every school's different. Every context is different. 
And the beauty of our program is it's a strategy. You know, we, we provide the boot camp, that's the, the core piece, the college workshop, the college summit workshop. Other than that, it's, it's very customized, very personalized. And so schools, depending on what other strategies they have in place, depending on the cultural context and the city um, and the state in which they operate, they can really modify the program to suit their needs. And it also helps the students have a high degree of ownership. Um, the peer leaders that we work with every summer, they go back to school in the fall and they really affect change in a way that makes sense for their school. Talk about the, um, the scope of your work geographically in the lower 48 in uh, Hawaii and Alaska um, and, and in uh, communities in urban and rural environments. Yeah, I mean, what's so interesting about College Summit is we're not, um, we're not a program that's only in cities. A lot of folks assume that when they talk to us, but uh, College Summit, we work in rural communities in West Virginia and South Carolina. We also work in urban communities in major cities, New York, Miami, LA, Oakland. Um, and we have reach in about 12 states this year. Um, and a regional footprint. We have local executive directors across the country um, and local teams who know the community and who work with schools. Because our program is so customized for schools, and schools really own it, and we become coaches for them as they implement the strategy to change the college-going culture, we don't have to be next door. We can be on the phone, we can be online. And what we've seen some success, some early success with, is actually supporting schools from our national office and providing really targeted interventions with the school through the year and visits. Does that mean that the investment the College Summit makes in its infrastructure has shifted to creating things like online knowledge bases, uh, online uh, facilities to share, used, utilizing things like webcams and and interactive meetings, desktop sharing, and so on? We're just beginning to dip our toes in the water when it comes to leveraging technology. So this year, um, just in October 2013, we launched collegeatmap.org. And what it is, is it was a, it's an output of a contest that we ran with the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. and Facebook to create 19 different mobile um, and Facebook apps that are available now for low-income students. And so those 19 different apps are focused on the you know, variety of steps, the variety of topics that need to get covered and understood for students, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, and even beyond. And they explore college and career. And the output of that contest is the collegeatmap.org. Mm -hmm. And what's so wonderful about it is it's apps that anybody can use. They're free, um, they're available, and students and counselors and schools can use them. So we're beginning to dip our toes in the water on that and really excited about the possibilities. Um, and this year we'll be trying for the first time to really measure the impact of using those apps. So your title of Chief Innovation Officer is very interesting in a nonprofit. You're not part of Google, you're not part of Facebook, you're not part of some of the other uh, innovative uh, tech firms that, that, that populate the field. How do you get to be a Chief Innovation Officer of a nonprofit? That's a great question. So I've been in this role for about two years and it was newly created um, and I stepped into it. And the reason we created the role of Chief Innovation Officer is we had a really robust, really great program team. We had um, educators and program experts who really understood that part of what we do. And we had, separately, um, folks who understood the sort of business aspects of what we do in finance. But we didn't have any place within the organization where we were looking at business models and we were able to sort of wed these two pieces of you know, getting more students to college and really understanding the program efficacy and also trying to do it in a way that was sustainable. So how do you continually improve? How do you continually finance? How do you, uh, you shift your staffing, your models, your use of technology? That's really part of your brief. Yeah, and also really thinking about 
how should we be thinking about business models and support models? So aside from the actual program tools and the curriculum that gets delivered to schools and the things we create and produce and the products, what's the business side of that? What underlies that? And how can we be changing that? You know, 50,000 students is incredible, I think. I mean, I started in 2004 with the organization and we were working with 3,500 students and that felt big to me at the time. 50,000 is remarkable, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to the actual need and what's out there. We previously were also talking with, um, with the head of the association um, that coordinates action amongst uh, small and mid-sized uh, colleges and universities and the demands that are being placed on uh, these colleges and mm -hmm. universities to accept students, to graduate students, to maintain standards and in fact to advance standards are pretty incredible. You have the, the shifts that are going on uh, in part based on affordability uh, to, um, to community colleges, um, those kinds of changes. How are your programs evolving to meet these different, different needs? When we started, we were working with students. You know, if you look at the evolution of College Summit, we started off working directly with students at the college boot camps. We evolved into providing a program that served 12th graders. And so we began working with schools and with their entire senior class. A few years later, based on customer need and based on schools asking for more, we created a program that was ninth through 12th grade and provides for the different sort of stages of a high school career for a student. They need different things. And right. so we created a curriculum that spanned their high school career. We are in the midst of really exploring how can we create a link sort of past high school to college and career for our students. To assure a, a graduation within a reasonable period of time. Yeah, yeah, and also to make future careers relevant to students. So I'm a senior and I'm struggling through my you know, calculus class and I'm thinking, how is this gonna help me in the future? And if I understand my North Star and I understand where I'm headed, and what possible careers would be interesting to me, and I can make that connection and make that future real to me today, I can be more effective and more motivated to struggle through the challenges that I'll face. And so I think that's, that's a core piece, and we actually have an initiative um, that we have just begun this year called Scholar Job, and it's, uh, it was launched at the White House uh, Summit on, uh, on College that was held earlier this year, and what it is, is it's basically linking corporate partners and to College Summit and linking these future careers to students' realities today in high school. To what extent are you uh, helping young people develop those job skills, whether it's showing up on time, being able to advance plan for, uh, to meet their obligations, and those kinds of things, uh, internship possibilities. To what extent do you get involved in those types of issues? Um, we are, there are aspects of that that we tackle in our high school curriculum. There's a lot of, um, for the seniors in particular, there's a lot of tactical process related milestones. Have you submitted, have you created your um, student essay? Have you submitted your personal, or, sorry, have you created your personal statement? Have you submitted your application? Have you filled out the federal aid forms? So there are a lot of tactical pieces for the 12th graders. Some of that is also looking at um, what uh, what skills do you need? What do you need to be thinking about as you make the transition to college? What does it mean to live on your own? What does it mean to live in a dorm and to have a roommate and somebody you don't know and make that transition? So I think, you know, we, we tackle some of these in our, in our um, high school curriculum. There's also an alumni program component for us. We have just um, recently started Twitter chats. So we have um, folks from LinkedIn, folks from different organizations and companies come in and sort of host um, Twitter chats with our alumni where they can ask anything they want to know. Um, so how do you show up for an interview? What do you need to know? Um, how, do you, how do you get an internship? How do you score your first internship? So we've really seen some value in engaging our alumni, so that students who have graduated from, from high school, gone on to college, and are sort of in those magical four years, engaging our alumni through social media. So let's talk about how you're organized. Describe to me the, the organization. So we have a national office here in Washington, D.C. 
and that houses sort of traditional infrastructure um, pieces. So we have an HR, IT, finance team. We also have our national programs team here, and mm -hmm. they really create the content. Um, they create the content that we deliver to students and schools, um, and they also help create the sort of support services. Through our national office, we also run our college boot camps that we talked about in the summer. We hire a uh, hundred or so summer staff right. who are um, actually, in large part, they're alumni of our program, who come back in the summer and actually run these college boot camps across the country. And does that function as an internship program for these young people? It's a job. It's a job. Um, we have a lot of uh, teachers, educators, a lot of folks who have the summer uh, off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, they come and they um, either serve as summer staff, which is right. an engagement through the summer, or they volunteer. So they come in for just one workshop and serve as a writing coach. We have a, you know, a variety of folks doing that, but a lot of alumni. So the, the team that runs the summer workshops is also based in our national office. That's okay. a centralized um, function that we have. We also have my team, the innovation team, that's run out of the national office. Um, and we have our marketing and alumni team. And of course, a fundraising department. Right. that works with our biggest national supporters um, and our wonderful national board of directors. So we have that national team here in DC and then across the country we have regional offices and based on the number of students we serve in each community and other factors they take different shapes. Um, in some places they're headed by an executive director and they have a full team um, to support the local operations. And in some places, they're much more programmatically driven um, in markets where there isn't as much uh, fundraising potential. How many of those offices do you have? Um, we have 11 offices. 11 offices, and, and the states are? Connecticut, New York and New Jersey, the National Capital Region, um, Florida, Missouri, Indiana, Colorado. Um, we have two offices in California. And we also work with students in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Interesting, interesting. And how does funding work for this organization? So we get our funding from a few sources. We have uh, fees that schools pay to work with us. Those fees really don't come close to covering the actual cost to operate the program in the schools. Mm -hmm. But it really helps to create that partnership between the schools and College Summit. Right. Um, they feel very bought in. Um, because it's something that they've had to put some money towards. So we get some fees from the schools. That's about 30% of the funding. And the remainder comes from a few sources. We have national funders, and those national funders include um, major corporations and companies, um, some of the big prominent foundations, and a significant number of individual donors who um, have been with us for a while. So that's about two-thirds of the funding? Yeah, um, two-thirds of the funding comes from both the national philanthropy and the regional philanthropy. So you also do contributed fundraising uh, drives on a regional basis? Yes. In yes. addition to the national mm -hmm. drives that, that, that you undertake? Yes. What is the future for College Summit? The future of College Summit is one that has us meeting the needs of our students, that has us creating even more relevance for high school students as they look at careers and creating that strong link and continuing to be a national voice and advocate for the challenges in the sector. Well, Michelle Telfel, thank you so much for describing the work of College Summit to us, and thank you so much for your insights. Thanks for having me.